Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm Megan Doherty, the director of the Museum of the White Mountains. It's wonderful to have you all here with us tonight, both in person and on Zoom. As we gather today, we are all on indigenous lands. For those of you joining us from home, I encourage you to learn more about the indigenous presence in your area, both past and present. Those of us at the museum are on Indakina, which is the ancestral and present homelands of the Abdaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples. And we're grateful for their stewardship of these lands and waterways. For those of you on, this, on Zoom, I'll put some links in the chat where you can learn more about the indigenous histories of your place at native-land.ca, as well as the Abnaki people of Northern New England through the Musée des Abnaki in Quebec. For our final event of our series, I'm grateful to Midge Goldberg for bringing together a talented group of poets to share their work with us tonight. Midge is a graduate of Yale. She's a longtime member of the Pow Wow River Poets, holds an MFA from the University of New Hampshire, and has taught at several colleges and poetry conferences in the Northeast. And she's gonna introduce each of our poets tonight. And our event tonight is made possible through support of New Hampshire Humanities in partnership with the National Endowment of the Humanities. And you can learn more at www.nhhumanities.org. And that is enough from me. Thanks, Mitch. Well, um, thank you very much for inviting us here tonight to read uh, for this kind of end of this exhibition that's been going on for over the summer on the Old Man of the Mountain. As I'm sure many, if not all of you know, um, for all of, for many, if not all of you, the Old Man of the Mountain has been a fixture, was a fixture in my life for many, many years. Anytime we came to Franconia Notch or we drove through it, you always had the same things. Where is it? I can't see it. Turn your neck. Wait, hold on. I think it's up there. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's great to have a reading around um, a physical landmark. I mean, I've participated in reading. I just edited a book called uh, about outer space and I participate in a lot of readings about outer space, a theme. You know, I participated in readings about a day or, you know, uh, something like that. But this is the first one about a physical landmark. And I mean, a real solid thing that's both, you know, of course, metaphorical, but also, you know, also not metaphorical, just there. And, you know, and so we're going to, um, we have plenty of room to hear poems that are about about it as well as about how we feel about it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I find fascinating is that because it's obviously been around for so long that we get to hear poems from people who have been looking at this same thing for so long and how you know what are the similarities of how they saw it to how we saw it and what are the how we saw it and what are the differences. Um, according to the highway. Um, but other than that, you know, the, what they what they looked at and what we looked at were the same, but how do we react to it? Just a tiny bit of history. I'm not a history expert, but I figured I should just throw this in here. Um, so the, um, as Megan referred to, um, you know, the, the Abenaki have, were, have uh, referred to this formation as stone face, and they had a legend about it, about Nis Kisos, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, an Abenaki leader who, eternally watches for his lost love um, from up there. Um, European settlers first recorded seeing it in 1805, and the first kind of publicized mention of it is Daniel Webster, the beginning of the 1800s. Um, Well-known poets started um, coming, writing about the old man soon after, starting with Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of uh, uh, help me here, Christian science. Um, I'm sure there's a more official name for it. Uh, I apologize. Um, you know, then you have uh, Longfellow, Whittier, and all, a lot of their acquaintances. Amazing how everyone seemed to know each other, um, uh, writing about it. Uh, we're going to be reading poems by a lot of these different poets. Each poet that comes up tonight is going to, I don't know if each one, but <laughs> many of them are going to be reading an old poem or two, as well as a newer poem or two. So a little roadmap to tonight, I'm going to introduce each reader and they'll read a few of their poems. And by the end, you'll have heard poems that span a few centuries, all about the old man of the mountain. 
So our first reader tonight is a uh, local, very local. <laughs> um, this is Liz All, professor here. Uh, she is the author of A Case for Solitude, excuse me, A Case for Solace, published by Lilly Poetry Review Books in 2022, and Beating the Bounds, published by Hobblebush Books in 2017, as well as several chapbooks, including A Thirst That's Partly Mine, winner of the Slapering Hole Chapbook Prize. <laughs> Uh, professor of English at Plymouth State University. Please join me in welcoming Liz All. I was feeling uh, insecure about only having one poem, even though I was momentarily feeling chuffed about having finally, after living here for 22 years and change, written my first poem about the old man on the mountain, inspired by this reading and my other insecurities about not having a poem about the old man on the mountain. <laughs> And so I have a second poem, which is not about the old man. You can bring out a hook if you want to, but I think you'll find it very related. It's very old man adjacent. Uh, and it's inspired by artwork, um, which are supremely competent people would have actually had up on this screen for you to look at if I were as supremely competent as they were. I got them that information in advance. I hope I uh, describe it well enough. This is uh, inspired by, and I think I saw it in this museum 10 years ago, a Winslow Homer black and white print from Harper's um, called Summit of Mount Washington. A couple of women on a horse, they're like flouncy skirts, and one of them's got her riding crop sort of pointing into the distance, and there's another woman who's got her skirts kind of up because she's hiking around. This is called The Bold Sister. They start the final ascent over and among boulders whitewashed by unfiltered sun, leaving the horses they rode all morning to hang their great heads and wonder where all the grass went. Up here among the clouds and the weird granite landscape, the bold sister traipses off with her bow, as if above the tree line nearer to God, a certain dispensation might be granted, a certain nakedness tolerated. Though the other sister still sits side saddle proper atop the Appaloosa, the accusing finger of her riding crop wagging at the couple who leave no room between them for even a sliver of light. The bold sister's skirts are hoisted, the better to traverse the rocks, the ruffle of her petticoat in plain view. Others scattered across the scraped landscape still wear their bowlers or nod beneath parasols. They will sleep tonight at the summit on rough but tidy mattresses stuffed with fresh moss, separated from the sleepless kitchen by a thin chased curtain. The air is different up here. As promised in all the papers, it presses you breathless like the forbidden hand of a bow your sister doesn't approve of. Tomorrow on the descent, they'll jostle and laugh, this motley group from Boston up for a summer romp, all rough and tumble among the dark crags and wrinkled granite walls. Tomorrow, the bold sister will catch a good scolding for fording a coursing flume by crawling astride a log, leg on either side, skirt hiked, easy as you please, like a man riding a horse. Beneath her precarious straddle, the rushing waters will blow a cool breeze into her skirts. Tomorrow, dinner at the profile house with shrimp forks and linen before catching the stage down to Plymouth, the flatter, more sensible lands, the gloving and putting away of hands, the grass, the calm, prim hills, the plain, hard packed dirt of the slow road home. And my second and final poem is actually, it fits the brief, as we say, uh, begins with an epigraph um, from Rachel Carson, who said, man is part of nature and his war against nature is inevitably a war against himself. And this is called nature, whatever that means. Nature, whatever that means, made him. 
nature, let's call it in this case, rain and sun and ice and dirt and granite and time and wind and gravity and maybe tunneling insects. And sure, let's also include the force of human eyes that spied in that outcropping a human profile. The humans who, seeking themselves, as usual, found a human face, a profile which seemed also to be seeking. Stone face, old man, the claiming and naming its own force of nature, the brutal ecosystem of chronically invasive civilization, not entirely unlike the tunneling insect or the insidious agendas of the water cycle. We colonizers, bring even more to this game. State quarters, self-congratulatory poems, license plates, an iconography not so different from that of our churches of granite and glass. And another thing we bring, our refusal to let nature, whatever that means, take its course, to continue doing what it had been doing when it created that miraculous, coincidental face. What if, instead of freezing it in place, shoring it up with steel cable and rods, fast drying cement, weatherproofing plastic, and even a concrete gutter, what if we'd let it keep unfurling, tumbling, falling? What even more surprising or necessary apparition might have been found in that equally natural rubble? Nature, whatever that means, is complicated. We accept the gift until we don't anymore, until geology conspires with climate to continue unleashing untidy boulders into a wild unsanctioned shape, which looks nothing so much as a pile, sorry, which looks like nothing so much as a pile of fallen boulders. We thought we were mending something broken with our tourniquets of chain, our stabilizing turnbuckles. We were sure we were protecting something in danger of breaking, though breaking was what brought us the face in the first place. There is no first place is the problem we can't face. Nature, whatever that means, is flux and chaos. If design, one too big for us to comprehend in our narrow pipsqueak lifetimes. The old man fell, finally, in darkness. Only the night creatures there to witness, to decree cataclysm, or to insist metaphor, neither of which any such creature would be inclined to do. We drove past the next morning on our way home from Pancakes, north of the Notch, shocked and rubbernecking, already grasping at names to fill the newly empty space. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Our next reader is uh, Don Kimball. His latest book is Late Autumn Raking, New and Collected Poems from Kelsey Books. He is a former president of the Poetry Society of New Hampshire. Welcome, Don. When the old man on the mountain fell so many years ago, um, I thought I should write something about it, but was daunted, was intimidated, and but it kept pestering me. And I would hear people talking about, oh, we should build it, rebuild it, and that kind of thing. So this is my attempt to kind of embrace that. Old man of the mountain. Now that the old man's face has fallen off, that stolid forehead, nose, and lantern jaw battered by 10,000 years of fire and ice, abruptly gone, how do we face this fault? An icon we New Hampshire folks were fond of showing off down to a pile of rocks. It's only right we'd want him back, yet only a matter of time. Some will go on to say, 
the way his face was fractured toward the last, while others feel it was an old man's broken heart that made him drop. One thing's for certain, nothing lasts or stays the same. Oh, we're it feasible now with so much else we need to think about to reconstruct on Cannon Mountain this old man's facade and not some grave symbolic gesture of plexiglass, <laughs> but cairn or granite gravestone at Profile Lake for those who need to know, for those who need to grieve and let him go. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Don. From former to present, we now have Melanie Chicoin, who lives in Amherst, New Hampshire, with her husband, poet Ala Kaki. Melanie's poems have appeared in Poets Guide to New Hampshire, More Places, More Poets, COVID Spring, Granite State Pandemic Poems, and others. Melanie is currently serving as president of the Board of Directors for the Poetry Society of New Hampshire and was a recent chief editor of PSNH's literary journal, The Poets Touchstone. Welcome, Melanie. Okay, just wait a minute. Thank you all for being here. I want to thank the Museum of the White Mountains and Midge uh, Goldberg for putting this together for all of you for coming tonight. Um, and thank you, Liz and Don, for some great writing. I, I thought we had seven minutes. You guys kind of blew that away. So um, I actually have a few pieces that, uh, so uh, I'm going to mix in a couple of my own pieces with some um, other more historical writings uh, related to the old man. So I will start with a very famous poem by Mary Baker Eddy that Midge referenced earlier, entitled The Old Man of Mountain. Gigantic sire, unfallen still thy crest. Primeval dweller where the wild winds rest. Beyond the ken of mortal air to tell what power sustains thee in thy rock bound cell. Or if when first creation vast began and far the universal fiat ran, let there be light from chaos dark set free. Ye rose, a monument of deity. Proud from yon cloud crowned height to look henceforth on insignificance that peoples earth, recalling oft the bitter draft which turns the mind to meditate on what it learns. Stern, passionless, no soul those looks betray. Though kindred rocks to sport at mortal clay, much as the chisel of the sculpture's art plays round the head but comes not to the heart. Ah, who can fathom thee, ambitious man, like a trained falcon in the Gallic van? guided and led, can never reach to thee with all the strength of weakness, vanity. Great as thou art and paralleled by none, admired by all, still art thou dear and lone. The moon looks down upon thine exiled height, the stars so cold, so glitteringly bright. On wings of morning glad fly, flit away, yield to the sun's more genial, mighty ray. The white waves kiss to the murmuring rill, but thy deep silence is broken, unstill. So 
is uh, one of my pieces. Uh, I, like Dawn, uh, had thought for many years of writing a poem. And I, I remember being about six when my dad took me there. And of course, I couldn't see it, you know. And, you know, even though I think they had the viewfinders then, I still couldn't focus my eyes. And I was telling him it wasn't there. And finally, I did. And, you know, my dad thought it was very humorous that I, I couldn't see it at first. This is entitled The Great Stone Spirit. Stone-faced in fog and feldspar, a ledge overlooks a lake mirrored in bedrock, frozen and thawed into and out of existence, while cradled in landscape the same of a thousand years. Where once a forehead rocked, back and forth, its sweat a slow erosion, onion skin weathered and scarred down to the jutted chin beneath a long bridged nose. Benevolent or harsh sentinel who beams a moonlight of cliffs upon the water, enormous and quiet within a long range wound with peaks the height of land nearby. And a talus slope to cradle the words of years across lips of legend, echoing in profile a thunderous roar through notch and valley. Clouds melt into mountain where the spirit still wanders. <clears throat> okay, so this is, I'll, I'll have two more. Uh, would you like to do my, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll put mine up now, but my, my second poem. This is a shape poem, concrete poem. There's different names for it. Um, but I asked if we could do a visual um, just so that you could see the shape of the old man's profile. Um, in the poem, I did my best. It's very <laughs> challenging to do a shape poem, but if you do a side by side with a lot of images, <laughs> this actually works pretty well. Uh, and uh, I appreciate the uh, discussion about indigenous culture and their relationship uh, with the old man. There is a beautiful love story attached to uh, the great stone face. Um, and there's also a creation story uh, regarding uh, the creation of stone men before men were made from ash trees. And um, it's very beautiful uh, from the Abenaki. And I tried to incorporate both uh, in, this, in this piece entitled Ash and Stone. And excuse me, I have to pull it up on my phone. Ash and Stone. Creator blew winds of life into stone, stirred into being spirits too naturally hardened of feeling, and shook the earth into pieces scattered across lands. And the kina molded the alnabak from ash trees who danced into life among leaves. Above the valley, a watcher seeker of centuries, waits for wet cheeks to extinguish the fire, for love to find her way home. Grandfather, son, mother earth, old man of the mountain, who live with intention within a communal language, who bind us in conscious harmony that we may move nearer ourselves among the woven adena. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Our next poet is Robert W. Crawford. He's the author of The Empty Chair, published by University of Evansville and winner of the 2011 Richard Wilbur Award. And Too Much Explanation Can Ruin a Man, published by David Robert Books. He's twice won the Howard Nemiroff Sonnet Award. He is the director of Frost Farm Poetry in Derry, New Hampshire, which includes the Hyla Brook Reading Series, the Frost Farm Poetry Conference, and the Frost Farm Poetry Prize. 
Robert? Thank you, Mitch. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I remember, like, I remember when the, the morning the old man fell. I remember it because I had to be driving back from Connecticut, and the Boston radio stations were having a field day with the event. <laughs> they had all these fake live reports from the scene, you know, all these New Hampshireites gathered around the fallen nose, firing 21 gun salutes, making vicious fun of us. It was actually pretty funny, but uh, <laughs> I do remember that for that. Um, I have the privilege uh, or the challenge of reading probably the oldest, the longest poem here tonight. Um, it's it's one of those old real stem winders of the, of the past. You know, in the days when people like a 10 page poem was nothing. If you didn't have at least 10 pages, you didn't. You, it wasn't worth it. Um, so bear with me, and I'll try to read this with the enthusiasm that uh, that's needed to get through this. And then I'll follow with a poem of my own if I can. It's going to be pretty uh, tough to follow. It says, this is written by John Frobridge, and it was uh, in July 1878. It appeared in the Atlantic. Uh, John was, uh, he, he was born in Illinois and came back east for some reason. Uh, lived in Massachusetts for a while. He was with a, you know, with, with, with that gang that Midge mentioned, all those poets for a while. He also lived in Maine. And he obviously went up once or twice to see the old man of the mountain. Uh, so he wrote this poem, The Old Man of the Mountain. Are you ready? All round the lake, the wet woods shake from droping boughs, their showers of pearl. From floating skiff to towering cliff, the rising vapors part and curl. The west wind stirs among the firs, high up the mountainside emerging. The light illumes a thousand plumes through billowy banners round them surging. A glory smites the craggy heights, and in a halo of the haze, flushed with faint gold far up, behold that mighty face, that stony gaze. In the wild sky upborne so high, above us perishable creatures, confronting time with those sublime and passive adamantine features. Thou beaked in bald high front, miscalled the profile of a human face. No kin art thou, O titan brow, to puny man's ephemeral race. The groaning earth to thee gave birth, throes and convulsions of the planet, lonely uprose in cran repose, those 80 feet of facial granite. Here. <laughs> Here, long, well, vast, slow ages past, thine eyes, if eyes be thine, beheld. But solitudes of crags and woods where eagles screamed and panthers yelled. Before the fires of our pale sires, in the first log built cabin twinkled, where red men came for fish and game, that scalp was scarred, that face was wrinkled. We may not know how long ago that ancient countenance was young. Thy sovereign brow was seamed as now when Moses wrote and Homer sung. Empires and states it annotates, and wars and arts and crime and glory. If that dim morn when man was born, the head with centuries was hoary. Thou lonely one, nor frost nor sun, nor tempest leaves on thee its trace. The stormy years are but as tears that pass from thy unchanging face. With unconcern as grand and stern, those features viewed, which now survey us, a green world rise from seas of ice, and order came from mud and chaos. Canst thou not tell what then befell, what forces moved, or fast or slow? How grew the hills, what heats, what chills, what strained dim life so long ago? High visage peak, wilt thou not speak one word for all our learned wrangle? What earthquake shaped, what glacier scraped that nose and gave the chin its angle. <laughs> our, our pygmy thought to thee is not, our petty questionings are vain. In its great trance, thy countenance knows not compassion nor disdain. With far off hum we go and come, the gay, the grave, the busy idol, and all things done to thee are one, alike the bur burial and the bridal. The, thy permanent long ages hence will mock the pride of mortals still. Returning springs with songs and wings and fragrance shall thy valleys fill. The free, wind the free winds blow, fall rain or snow. The mountains brim, their crystals breakers, the crystal beakers still come and go, still ebb and flow. 
the summer tides of pleasure seekers. The dawn shall gild the peaks, where build the eagles, many a future pair, the gray scat, scud lag on wooden crag, dissolving in the purple air. The sunlight gleam on lake and stream, boughs wave, storms break, and still at even, all glorious hues the world suffuse. Heaven mantle earth, earth melt in heaven. Nations shall pass like summer's grass, and times unborn grow old and change. New governments and great events shall rise in science new and strange. Yet will thy gaze confront the days with its eternal calm and patience. The evening red still light thy head above thee, burn the constellations. O oh, silent speech, what will what well can teach the little worth of words or fame? I go my way, but thou shalt thou wilt stay while future millions pass the same. But what is this I seem to miss? Those futures fall into confusion, a further pace. What was that face? The various fugitive illusion, the various fugitive illusion. Gray Ed, Ed, Edelon so quickly gone, with eyes that make the onward move, whose vast pretense of permanence a little progress can disprove. Like some huge wraith of human faith that to the mind takes form and measure, grim monolith of creator myth, outlined against eternal treasure. O oh, Titan, how dismissal art thou, a withered cliff as all we see, that giant knows that grand repose, have in a moment ceased to be, or still depend on lines that blend, on merging shapes in sight and distance, and in the mind alone can find imaginary brief existence. He almost like Chris saw the end. <laughs> all right. Now I, have to, now I have a challenge of following that with a poem of my own. Um, this is a little shorter. Um, <laughs> well, not shorter, actually. Uh, um, and it's not really, it's, it's, it doesn't have the old man in it, though it has the Franconia range. So it was pretty close. You probably could have seen the old man if he was still there, but it was written after he fell down. The naming of lights. A line of storms has cleared Mount Lafayette and opened up the sky for counting stars. Some nights, this is the show I want to watch, but not tonight. A front has passed. The hints of autumn air make, the more, make me more interested in local constellations, human lights. I want to see how many I can name. I think I can account for most of them. The easiest are the Cannon Mountain Summit Station, the Pinestead Farm, the Mitterzell Resort, harder are Franconia's Inn's backlights, half hidden by the trees along Ham Branch. Up where the interstate from Boston leaves the notch, car headlights slide, the broken strand of pearls towards Littleton and Montreal. Maybe one of them is one I know, driving a Subaru, familiar with this valley, me, enough to find me here. Someone to help me name those last few lights. And in the moment that it takes to see the mountains now are darker than the sky, to feel the chill that overtakes my arms, the stream of cars has been reduced to one. A single light drops down the mountainside, a hot white tear or slowly falling star. Right. Well, thank you for that interpretation. <laughs> that was wonderful. Uh, our next poet is Gordon Lang. Gordon is a retired high school English teacher who raises Irish wolfhounds and gypsy horses. His work is collected in two books, graphic sax and violins, <laughs> and no match for a scarecrow. Gordon? <laughs> Oh, Bob, you're always a tough act to follow here. Um, Bob didn't mention it, but he is the poet in charge of uh, one of the Frost Museums, the um, Frost Place in yeah. um, in Derry. And there's another Frost Place just north of here in Franconia. Um, I was lucky enough to get a fellowship to go there one summer, um, and 
Uh, Maggie Dietz apparently got to tag along one summer when her husband was the poet um, leading fellowships at that time. And she, I think, got to roam around and be inspired um, as she was in the presence of Frost, his trails, and the old guy. She calls this poem, Leave No Trace. <clears throat> no gate, no main entrance, no ticket, no ranger. Not far from where Frost once raised chickens and ill-fated children, near where the old man's face, old man's glacier-hewn face, though bolstered to its godlike roost by rods and turnbuckles, slid from our fledgling millennium into oblivion. You can cross the Pemajawasset on a bridge, then compass north, but southbound on the trail, ascend an old grassed over logging road to the carved out collarbone of Cannon Mountain. This is Lonesome Lake. How you go from here depends on why you've come. To out a spruce grouse, or listen for the we are of a Bicknell's thrush, for a breezy picnic or a midlife crisis, a long haul or a day trip to the Cascades. Bring for your purposes only what you need. Salmon jerky, a canteen or camelback, Band-aids, a ratchet and strap, a roughed up heart. Bring sunblock, a notebook, the Beatles, Beyonce, the Bhagavad Gita, a Bible, some Hitchens or Hegel. However long you stay, you must leave nothing. No matchbox, no pull tip, no grommet, no cup. Carry in and out your cliff bar wrappers, your fear of bears and storms. Keep the rage you thought you'd push through your boot soles into the stones, the grief you hoped to shed. If you think you've changed, take all your changes with you. If you lift an arrowhead from the leaves, return it. Pocket no pine cone, no pebble or fairy root. Resist the painted trillium, even if its purple throat begs to be pressed between your trail guide's pages. I cheated on my poem. It's not truly about the old stone head, but about another head just due east of there in the Pemajawasset wilderness. Um, I don't know if we have any peak baggers in here. I see you guys climbing a lot. Um, have you done Owl's Head yet? It's in the middle of nowhere. Okay, and and it's one of those ones that people who are trying to become members of the 4,000 yeah. Footers Club kind of leave it for later because it's just over 4,000 feet and it's in nowhere's land. Um, I had been, for years, I'd been planning this one. I had so many different routes. In fact, I started up Cannon Mountain and was going to go down the other side and up over the Flume and Liberty and Lafayette and all those other things. It was going to take like five days, but it was going to be all part of that disaster. It didn't happen. <laughs> Another time, though, that's what this one's about. Argoflex. After the rain, when the sky is, at, is its bluest, is the time to climb Owl's Head. Camping at 13 Falls leaves time to dawdle. You can clean up, poke about, play in the water once the scout troop is on its way, and still have time to circle round to the west side, be up in time for lunch, be up on top for lunch. Now, this is important. When that ring-necked bird that looks like a grouse crowds you in on your rock, coming closer and closer until you can't focus the lens of your Argoflex any tighter, Put the camera down. 
That's what I said. Put the camera down and share your lunch. <laughs> Memory will have to suffice. And words, when they tell you that there is no such thing as a ring-necked grouse, and without a shot to share, this is all just a flying fish tail, <laughs> one that got away, smile. Smile and remember what you saw. For it is in you, it is in you now, for as long as you remember to look at it from time to time. More accessible than the photos on your phone. But do share this too. The next time you see someone Instagram their food, <laughs> say, put the camera down. Let pleasure be inside you and think of it from time to time. The best cheesecake in the world is on the Isle of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides. And I know this because I have eaten my cake and still have it too. I meant to mention this before that poem. Um, I had the pleasure of working with um, a young woman who was probably the last person to photograph the old man in the mountain. She was traveling up, um, going right by Profile Lake as just after the sun had set. It was like 8.30 that May night. And um, they got out and took it in the gray and and they were already late for where they were going and and probably it's the last recorded image and i'm sure the picture is absolutely worthless but the story <laughs> thank you gordon all right josh nicolaisen lives in campton new hampshire with his wife sarah and their daughters grace and azalea he is a professional gardener and former high school teacher. He holds an MFA from Randolph College and is a Pushcart Prize nominee. Josh's work has recently appeared or is, in, or is forthcoming in Colorado Review, Clockhouse, So It Goes, Appalachian Review, and elsewhere. I'm really thrilled to have Josh join us here tonight. Josh. Since I'm coming up to put his slides up, I feel obligated to say he's also a PSU grad. So let's add that to the bio signature. So welcome back. Yeah, thank you. There's a lot more people than when I sat down. <laughs> hey. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. My name's Josh. I'm gonna try and hammer through probably too many poems. I'm gonna try and do it without talking, see if I can get through these for you. I think I can do it without going over my time. Um yeah, they asked if we wanted slides, so I was like, sure. <laughs> but we can do that. Um, so like Gordon, I'll start, I'm gonna start a little bit east of the old man. Um, this is Elephant's Head in Crawford Notch. I, I pilfered this from Google, I didn't take that picture. Mm -hmm. um, but this poem is called New Hampshire's Pachyderm. <laughs> Poking through a canopy of conifers, its peripherals gaze to the east and west, past the rocky pass, as tusks and trunk disappear into trees and the midday sun warms its gray granite forehead. With its strong seismic senses and knowledge of many years since the ice left it here, the protective pachyderm keeps watch over the notch as climbers carefully ascend its face and families of people and birds perch and picnic upon his patient head. Cool. Yeah. You got it. Cool. Switch your picture? No, I don't have a picture for this one. <laughs> no. Um, this is this is like a series of five haiku. Uh, six if you count the title, I guess. Um, it's another one. Shooting star from the summit of Mount Hale during vernal equinox. Fire tower torn. Winter tide now receding. A river like bright. Celestial ship, dot of constellation gone, spilled scintillation, resplendent golden effulgence, smoldering sky flame, nightlight of the past, snowfield of granite refracting glow back, 
pool of dark black swallowing. Spring starts tomorrow. In our tired eyes, something long lost died tonight. Cool. This is, excuse me, um, Petronuris grandiflora. Doesn't grow around here at all. Like, <laughs> no, this grows in four Rocky Mountain states. It does not grow here whatsoever. But this is American sonnet for Tetranius grandiflora. Some beautiful things grow to learn how to survive almost anything. Greylocked alpine nights and only the scant nutrients of a pebble thick soil. Cranking winds and it hasn't rained in weeks. You're thirsty, but still woolly and popping off. Finally, your one monocarpic shot sprung from stone in notched florets. You are a face of rays, a botanical physiognomy of Helios, a face that too owns a handful of names, a face thriving far west of where the man in Franconia perched, a face with whom you share one name, a face like his, yours, will someday fall off to rest in shards amongst the talus. All right, got two more for you. We'll get, I'm getting, I'm at cannon now, kind of. I'm on the mountain. <laughs> I thought this, I thought this might help, yeah. This is Ben Brackett. This poem is for my buddy, Benny. Um, ben went to Plymouth with me here. Um, he's an awesome dude, he was crazy. He died in an avalanche in 2012, skiing out west. So this is a, song for, this is a poem for Benny. Not all heroes wear capes, but you did. <laughs> the day we climbed Whitney Gilman Ridge and it was too cold to be scanning, scaling Cannon's Cliffs without a jacket. But you did. It wasn't so much a cape as our rope bag tied to look like a cape. We laughed so hard that night when we descended, four heads, zero lights. Not all legends get viral memes made about them, but you did. Multiple. Paddle guitaring a shark or vertical raft through lava. Your grin in stark contrast to both the terrified faces of your guests and the teeth of the shark. <laughs> you were generally the biggest jerk <laughs> at jerk fest, where your reckless performance was admirable. You were the first dude in college who asked me to join a group project. I think about you when I hear Hot Rod Circuit because we both had their t-shirt. Sometimes in the mountains, I hear dead flowers, rolling stones, the end of the Big Lebowski, all of us drinking and singing after your funeral. What makes a man a hero? Call it a ballad, call it an elegy. I think you'd call it an ode, an echo of how snow can crush and suffocate just seconds after it looks so beautiful, so bright, so falsely still so falsely light. Right. One more, I'll go fast. This one's called My Old Man. I dug through a box. This is actually the last picture I found that I took of the old man on like a point and shoot camera when I was in high school. Um, so I took a picture of a picture. Um, and that's it. Um, and if you know me and thought you were getting out of here without hearing about my daddy issues, notes. <laughs> so, my old man. And this has an epigraph, uh, the Daniel Webster quote most of you probably know. Men hang out their signs indicative of their respective trades. Shoemakers hang out a gigantic shoe, jewelers a monster watch, and the dentist hangs out a gold tooth. But in the mountains of New Hampshire, God Almighty has hung out a sign to show that there he makes men. All right. My old man, more than 20 years have passed since he dropped, and I've still not stopped to see his memorial. I remember when Grandpa first brought me to meet our old man, close enough to see, close enough to feel, but not to touch. I stared up, not knowing that as a man, 
I'd, sh I'd scale the sheer cliff, propping that blocky face. Back then, I was eight, and my father loved to drink. I spent boyhood dreaming of what it would mean to climb the old man. I clung by finger pinch to his rock hard crag. Oh, how he scarred this land. I was always waiting for his nod of approval, though his downward gaze remained stone faced. I wanted him to teach me something soft. That was not his way. Two signs stood at the end of our patchwork driveway. One sign showed a trap and buoy, the other a robust buck. On May 3rd, 2018, I, or May 3rd, 2003, I was 18, about to leave home and looking for signs in everything. That was the day our old man grew too tired. He pulled out the tubes and gave the world one final fatal nod. Watching this news next to my father, I knew what Daniel Webster had said about God in New Hampshire. I thought I knew what I had to do about being a man. I've discovered nearly everything I knew was untrue. And it's no use pretending he's there when he isn't. All right. Thank you so much, Josh. Those are great. Nice to have the, the pictures to go with them. Um, uh, so I'm going to close out this reading with two poems. One is by um, a woman that I have been very interested in. Her name is Lucy Larkham. She's a poet. Uh, she lived in Massachusetts, and she loved to come up here to the, to the mountains on vacation. She, uh, I love thinking of her climbing to the top of mountains in the skirts, like Liz mentioned. I can't imagine when I stand up there how someone got up there in skirts and whatever shoes she was wearing. But um, she visited this area, Campton, in 1861 with John Greenleaf Whittier and his sister. And in a diary she wrote, um, no, in a letter she wrote about the gate of the Franconia Notch opening dimly afar with its mountain haystacks piled beside it. It is rest to soul and body to be among these mountains. So this, this poem, I really like to imagine her, you know, she did all this summer traveling, then she'd go back to her solitary room in Massachusetts. She was a teacher, I think at a girl's school. And in the winter, she'd think back about her, um, all the hiking and trips she took in the summer. This is called My Mountain by Lucy Larkham. I shut my eyes in the snowfall and dream a dream of the hills, the sweep of a host of mountains, the flash of a hundred rills. For a moment, they crowd my vision, then moving in troops along, they leave me one still mountain picture, the murmur of one river's song. Tis the musical Pemigewasset that sings to the hemlock trees of the pines on profile mountain, of the stony face that sees. Far down in the vast rock hollows, the waterfall of the flume, the blithe cascade of the basin, and the deep pool's lonely gloom. All night from the cottage window, I can hear the river's tune, but the hushed air gives no answer save the hemlock's sullen ruin. A lamb's bleat breaks through the stillness, and into the heart of night, afar and around the mountains, veiled watchers expect the light. Then up comes the, the radiant morning to smile on their vigils grand, still muffled in cloudy mantles. Do their stately ranges stand? It is not the lofty haystacks piled up by the great notch gate, nor the glow of the cannon mountain that the dawn and I await. To loom out of northern vapors, excuse me, to loom out of northern vapors, but a shadow, a penciled line that grows to an edge of opal where earth light and heaven light shine. Now rose tints bloom from the purple. Now the blue climbs over the green. Now bright in the bath, in its bath of sunshine, the whole grand shape is seen. Is it one or unnumbered summits? The vision so high, so fair, hanging over the singing river in the magical depths of air. Ask not the name of my mountain. Let it rise in its grandeur lone. Be it one of a mighty thousand or a thousand blent into one. Would a name evoke new splendor from its wrapping in folds of light or a line of the weird rock writing make plainer to mortal sight? You have lived and learnt this marvel that the holiest joy that came from its beautiful heaven to bless you nor needed nor found a name. 
enough on the brink of the river, looking up and away to know that the hill loves the Pemigewasset and broods o'er its murmurous flow. Perhaps if the Campton Meadows should attract your pilgrim feet up the summer road to the mountains, you may chance my dream to meet, either mine or one more wondrous. Or perhaps you will look and say, you behold only rocks and sunshine, be it dying or birth of day. Though you find but the stones that build it, I shall see through the snowfall still, hanging over the Pemigewasset, my glorified dream crowned hill. I guess Lucy Larkin wasn't on Instagram either. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to close out the reading with, uh, like Liz, uh, actually hearing that Liz was inspired to write a poem. I thought, gosh, I should do that too, maybe try. So I wrote this um, villanelle called In the Notch. I try to look at where it ought to be. The old man of the mountain was up there. From here, it is impossible to see. We'd camp beneath this mountain, just we three, in one tent that the kids and I could share. We'd try to look at where it ought to be, then hike the path past hemlock, brooks, and scree, and pass under the interstate to where from that spot it was possible to see. Years later, driving through, only me, kids grown, the old man fallen down, I'd stare, trying not to look. <laughs> It ought to be more than a silence hanging heavily. I'm left with signs uncertain in the air. And yet, though it's impossible to see, there's something blurred and blotted, shimmery, an image that both is and isn't there. I try to look at where it ought to be. I'm here, perhaps it's possible to see. Thank you. Thank you all for such a wonderful hour and kind of travel through through space and time. That was really, we may have been talking about a, a literal place, but it, it felt like we definitely went, went on a trip. So thank you all for that. It's great to have so many of you here. Um, for those of you that are here in person, we do have some surveys. We're always interested to hear what you thought about the event tonight. For those of you on Zoom, Inez, will you push return on my computer? Um, and I'll put a survey into the chat. Um, and this event, as I said, wouldn't be possible without the support of the New Hampshire Humanities. And our exhibition upstairs will stay open for a little while. Those of you who are here in person, if you haven't had a chance to see it, Please take a moment. Uh, there is some, some more poetry up there. If this wasn't enough, there's more um, on display. Some um, Franklin Levitt poems that are up on the wall and then some really, um, really quite sweet uh, poems, some of which are, are kind of mounted um, mid 19th, late 19th century poems that, that Inez was able to find for the exhibition. So if this wasn't enough, there's more upstairs. Um, but again, thank you all for joining us tonight. And this all couldn't be possible without the support of those of you who are here and our members. So our exhibition, you know, is really, our exhibition program is made possible through the support of our members. And so thank you to those of you who are here. And um, if you aren't already a member, please consider joining us. So thank you all again for coming.